Good morning everyone and welcome to service today. Um, just a couple of reminders really. One regarding the Tom Elliott event on the 11th of June. Um, if you haven't already got your tickets then please see Helen. It's going to be a fabulous evening of entertainment so uh, please come along. The second one is a Life Group ladies event. So unfortunately gentlemen, you can't come on this one. <laughs> Um, it's a, we've got a special evening on the 15th of June um, with a special guest from the body shop coming to talk to us. So if you'd love to come to that, just have a word with Helen or Pearl um, and they'll tell you the details of that. But thank you very much and I'll hand you over to Jo. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So the first one we have done before... Um, uh, we, this is an invitation for everybody to stand and to be present in the presence of God. So we ask you all to come and worship the Lord. This is Come All You People. And we'll sing it in English and Zimbabwe. You can going to stand there and sing. <laughs> Oh 
And so with that invitation to lay down our burdens and our shame and to meet with the one who knows us and offers us wholeness and healing. So I invite you to take your piece of charcoal. I'd like you to hold it without a tissue so that your hands get mucky. So hold your piece of charcoal. If you haven't got some, there's still some at the back of chapel. But as you hold your piece of charcoal, just notice it in your hand, how it might be different from other pieces of coke or of coal that you may have held before. Notice how it's got the rings of the compressed tree within it and those shards where it's been attached to a different piece of coal, the sharper edges. Notice the cracks and the fissures. And as you roll it around your hands, notice how it's causing your hands also to be mucky. Each piece of coal that you are holding in your hands is crammed full of carbon atoms, crushed under the weight of the universe. Holding in your hand will be carbon atoms which were once stardust, which were once soil, which were once exploded and ignited, which were once air. Each piece of coal holding in your hands tells the story of creation silently and powerfully the ashes and the dust and the stardust within every living thing contained in your hand in your hand you're holding the whole of the universe as you hold this charcoal as you look at it as you notice it God made it. God loves it. God keeps it. And so as you hold this charcoal, noticing how your hands have been changed already by the experience. Yes, of course you can see it, sweetheart. Especially in your white trousers. As we hold our piece of charcoal, doing all of that noticing, knowing that we hold the carbon atoms of the universe, so we offer our silent praises to God for all that God has given to us and the ways in which the world is still changing. We thank God for holding the world in his hands. We thank God for the power which compresses carbon atoms into such simple beauty. As we look at some of the rougher edges of the piece of charcoal that you're holding, perhaps you want to give thanks for the people who have been connected to you. The people who sharpen your edges. And having praised God for a piece of charcoal that God has made, God loves and God keeps, so too we look at our hands and we notice the emotions that we are carrying as we're trying desperately not to get this dust anywhere else, especially near my daughter. (laughs) As we notice the dust and the debris, the mess and the chaos, notice how you're feeling trying not to make a mess. Notice all the things that you've already done to try and not make a mess those of you still using the tissue paper rather than getting it on your hands, those of you really not touching it because this is just a bit too weird. 
or else those of you that have really taken me at my words and have really gone to town. And so we offer our confession to God. God of ashes and dust, who know the debris of our lives, who has walked in the dust of humanity. We confess that the world is a mess, that sometimes we are the cause of it, sometimes just passive observers of it. Sometimes we don't understand it, and sometimes, although we're trying really hard, we still get messy. And as we hold this piece of charcoal, so too, Lord, we hold ourselves before you, our rough edges and our brokenness, the times when we feel the weight of the universe on our shoulders, our weariness and our sense of being burned out, all those things that we're trying hard not to let infect other people, just like our mucky fingers on our clothes and hymn books this morning. In Jesus, we know that the debris and the dust and the mess has been dealt with. And so I invite you, before you do anything with your hands, just to put your piece of charcoal down safely. And as you do, notice how your anxiety changes. You may still be worried about not kicking it. <laughs> you may still be worried about where you're going to put it. But notice how you now feel different not holding on to the thing that has weighed you down, albeit for three or four moments. And yet the piece of charcoal, the universe that was in your hand, still contains the ignition of possibility, the invitation of power and of fire, of heat and smoke and ash. It still has the potential to catalyse the kingdom of God. Jesus appeared to his friends by a barbecue and invited them to live a life marked out by love. And it's that love in which we know that the mess and the debris has been dealt with. What I love about this is how many people at this point have already reached for the wet wipes. So if that's not you, <laughs> please feel free now to grab a wet wipe and to clean your hands as we continue to pray together. Gods of healing and of wholeness, of ashes and stardust. So we bring our brokenness our sinfulness, our fears, our despair and our mess and lay them at the foot of your cross. God of healing and wholeness, of ashes and stardust, we hold out our now clean hands and offer to you our minds and our souls that we may know your peace a peace that surpasses all understanding and takes away the weight of the world. God of healing, of wholeness, of ashes and stardust, give us the faith and confidence to know that our broken lives are made whole and that your kingdom is igniting its power throughout our world and our lives. Cleanse us, make us clean, and may your kingdom come, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Having thought about
coal and fire and the weight of the world. So now we shift our metaphors a little as we sing our next song, a song which talks about stepping deeper into our relationship with Jesus, being confident in following where Jesus is leading, even in the places where we think it is impossible. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown where feet may fail.
The first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 9 to 15. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. The next section is headed Lydia's conversion in Philippi. From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, And the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there for several days. On the Sabbath we went outside the city gates to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of these listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, She invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And thus she persuaded us. Amen. Thank you, Peter. I wonder where you go to meet God. I wonder where you go when you need an encounter with God. I wonder if you're the sort of person that needs to get out and about, to to walk it out with Jesus. Someone who notices God in the outdoors amongst the trees and the seasons and the pollen and the grass. I remember speaking to one person here who said, I just need to go fishing. I wonder if you're the sort of person who needs silence. Whether it's the way to drown out everything else and to be enveloped by peace and quiet and centeredness whether it's noise-limiting headphones and darkened rooms. I wonder whether you need a candle lit. I wonder if you're the sort of person who needs the noise, loud music and a drum party, that the drumming beat and the invitation to let your hair down and mosh your way into God's arms. I wonder if you like architecture, and that bricks and engravings and the artist's craft with golden gilding and paint strokes invite you just to marvel. I wonder if you need the cold of stone beneath your feet and against your back as you lean into the presence away from the heat of life. I wonder if you need a choir alongside you like all those people in Litchfield yesterday. I wonder if you retreat away, finding space in a different place and a new place, finding folk to speak to you of ancient wisdom, allowing those old pilgrim paths to guide your very modern way of thinking once again. I wonder if you turn to bread and wine and the symbols of faith, broken before us and mysteriously making us whole again. I wonder if you need your hands to be busy and your heart to be offering something simple. Chosen tasks of nurture and performance and care, which few see, but which God accepts as your worship and your duty to perform. Flower arranging, gardening, 
Lego. I wonder if you go to a body of water and enable water to restore your soul, refreshing you from the inside out or standing in the storm on a rainy day and just dancing under the thunderstorm. I wonder if you come here to this place to encounter God's. And I wonder whether you answered that too quickly or too slowly. Is this the place that you encounter God's? Without these walls and this blue carpet, would you still find a place to encounter God with these same people? I wonder where you go to encounter God. I don't think that any of these options, after all, are mutually exclusive. I could talk about encounters that I've had in gardens, in front of wells, in beaches, in an Ibiza nightclub, on street corners serving with street pastors, in church halls and Christian festivals, in a campsite, and even the bath. Don't stick with that image too long. Sometimes, after all, it's about being the right person in the right place at the right time, paying attention to what's happening. And sometimes, encountering God feels a lot like being in the wrong place at the wrong time and still being willing to flow, follow the flow of what you're being invited into. Sometimes... Just sometimes it is about showing up at the same time, at the same place, because one day it might all be different. I wonder where you go to encounter God. In the passage that Peter has read to us today, this is the fundamental question, not only because we're beginning to pray into God's future for us as a Methodist circuit in Wolverhampton and as a Methodist people here in Codsall. There are many people asking those self-same questions across the whole of the Methodist church. But it also invites us to ask that question because it's at the heart of the Bible passage today. This latter part of Acts 16 is effectively written in two halves. Firstly, Luke does his thing. He takes us on a very detailed whistle-stop tour of geography, all those places that Paul travelled before his encounter with Lydia. We need to notice that he takes something of a roundabout route. Paul doesn't actually want to go to Macedonia, who'd blame him. We're told the lengths that he would go to in order to provide quite a scenic route into this part of Eastern Europe. We're told that Paul sees a vision and a request from help from a man that he never meets. A man appears to him in his dream and says, come to Macedonia, we need your help. We're never told what help they need and we never see that man again as we're told about Lydia later on. Secondly, then, we don't so much focus then on Paul's detailed geographic tour of Eastern Europe. Instead, we see the strange woman that he ends up meeting in a chance encounter on a riverbank with a Gentile and a former officer of the Jewish religious police having a conversation and an encounter together with God's. The only things we're told about Lydia is that she makes fabric. She's a dealer in expensive purple linen. We're told that she was seeking God and that she was a woman of potentially strong faith. So Lydia, this entrepreneur of linen cloth, this Gentile, regularly goes to the river to pray. It's possible that this was a known place in the village. Paul often went into local towns and found the place where people were asking questions of spirituality and faith. This would often be a house church or a synagogue. Instead, Paul enters Macedonia, 
listens a little bit to what people are telling him and heads down to the riverbank. The seekers and the faithful were all there. We can surmise about Lydia that she would have been well respected. She was a single woman. We're not given any detail about her life and her livelihood beyond the fact that she was good at her job. She was known as an entrepreneur and that she sold expensive linen. She wasn't defined or determined by any other nature of household. And because she exchanged this expensive cloth, she served the elite of Philippi. Thus, she will have been respected for her work and her craft. It also meant that she knew how to be in the company of the rich, the respected, and the respectable. It's for this reason that later on, when Paul is petitioned very powerfully to go and stay in her house, that he would accept this opportunity and invitation, almost feeling obliged to accept the hospitality of one who was of a higher order than he. Lydia plays her part. She is curious. She follows her heart and her gut regularly to that riverbank. We can surmise that she probably wasn't on her own. And Paul, too, plays his part, although reluctantly going to this Gentile city and searching out those people of peace with whom to pray and discuss with. And as Lydia and Paul play their part, so too does the Spirit of God, nudging them both into this encounter, which for both of them changes their worlds. Paul, reluctant to go to the Gentiles, now realises that this is where the Spirit is calling him. Lydia, self-seeking her own spiritual identity, finds her home in this new Christian community. So I wonder if we expect to encounter God these days and what we expect to be changed when we do. A powerful and difficult story is told of some missionaries who returned to their townships in Africa where they'd had a very successful ministry. Prior to this last visit, they would often tell the stories of the numbers of significant conversions that they were a part of when they served this small community. However, on this last visit, they discovered that most of the women were now alcoholic a surprise for Methodist ministers. What had happened is that the women had seen their missional endeavour as an invitation to the American dream. They hadn't so much converted to Christ than to Hot Point, wanting a washing machine and a microwave, and seeing that white goods were the product of the white person. The consequence then of their conversion and their use of white good washing machines was that the women no longer went down to the river to have a good natter and a gossip. The women lost their support network. They lost their village. They lost their identity, which was more than just washing their clothes. And so they turned to the local pub and instead of going to the river, went to the bar instead. It's a challenging story because I think when we often want people to encounter God, we expect it to be on our terms. We don't necessarily expect to be changed in the encounter. So where do we go to encounter God? And where do we go to enable God to encounter others? The story of Paul and Lydia is not just about Lydia's conversion. It's about Paul's too, and the change in his missional operandi. I wonder what God is saying to us as we notice the spirit in this building, in our hybrid online way of working, and in our wider community. I wonder how we host the holy, offering up the hospitality which changes and challenges all of us. For Paul, this single woman, 
a business entrepreneur, his con competitor really in the fabric market, remembering that Paul used to be a tent maker, who now lived in Europe, an interested Gentile into what was happening with these Jesus following folk, in a place with no synagogue, marks out Paul's change and self understanding and practice of mission. Paul needed to give up control, to lose expectations and to be open to the nudge of the Spirit, changing how he ministered and offered spaces of encounter and worship. Dare we be so bold? Dare I be so bold? What are simply non-negotiables for us? And what's worth putting on the line for the kingdom of God? Ultimately, we need to trust in God alone, which is where we now join in worship again together. I will trust in you, using a newer variation of the words of Psalm 23. Thank you. So when I go uh, out walking, which I like to do, I, uh, if there's a stream involved and trees and green grass and flowers and preferably quite a lot of sunshine, that's, uh, that's where I find God. Please stand and be singing, the Lord's my shepherd.
who it is that we're encountering, to know God's character. We need to know how we feel when the Holy Spirit is near, to notice it and to recognise it and to call it out, to be attuned to our bodies in our spirituality. We say something similar in our baptism services. Part of the task I see of baptisms is to help families to engage in this early encounter with God and to begin to give language to what it is they're looking for and searching for. We now have most of our baptisms outside of a Sunday morning service, partly a consequence of COVID and worrying about numbers, Um, partly just because family life changes and Sunday mornings are not always the most helpful. And so it is that we had a baptism this week for Charlie Crane. Having spent some time reflecting on ourselves from charcoal to that broad challenge about how it is that we encounter gods and where we are changed, I've recruited a little bit of help to help us think about what God is like. And so we're going to read together for you the book that we give all of our baptism children, a book called What is God Like? by Matthew Paul Turner and Rachel Held Evans. We read this in our baptisms as a blessing to the families. We read it today, partly connecting what happened on Wednesday to us here in this space in God's mystery of time but also as a way for us to be inspired perhaps a little bit differently about actually who it is that we are seeking to encounter in our worship. What is God like? Very big question. One. that people from, from places all around the world have wondered about since the beginning of time. And while nobody has seen all of God, because God is far too big for anyone to fully see him, to fully see. We can know what God is like. God, God is like an eagle, sharp eyed and swift. And swift with wings so wide you can play under the shadows. God is like a river, constant and life giving when you grow near God, you'll sprout up like a strong and as a tree. God is God is like uh, the stars forever, forever present and bright, even when they feel far away. You can always look up and see them winkling at your at you. God is like a sharp shepherd, shepherd, brave, brave and good, a protector, protector who loves her sheep so much that she watched over all of them and know each of their names by heart. God is like a fort, strong and secure, secure with walls that are mighty, mighty and safe inside there. There are hidden places to hold you when you're scared or needed, need a quiet place to rest. Gardener. God is like a gardener, patient, 
patient and nurturing. nurturing. God, God plants water, weeds, and, and fertilizes. F- fertilizes the earth until every, every good thing on it sticks. Seeks. Seeks the nourishing. Nourishing sun and grow. Well done, that was tough. Yes. God is like a flame of a candle, warm and living. Inviting. Inviting. God. With. God. With God. With God. Close by, you can look to the light and see through Three. the darkness of night. Great job. God, God is like the wind. Passionate. Passionate and full of mysteria. Is it mystery? Mystery. God is like both here and mysteriously. 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 Also, over there, God is everywhere, swirling, swirling through the world, 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 world whistling. whistling across mountain uh, ranges, m- mountain ranges, whistling, whist- whistling through trees and pressing, pressing against you, your, your cheeks on a breezy day. God is like an artist. Creative. Creative and unpredictable. Unpredictable. Always buzzing, making and remaking. Remaking everything. Brilliant. Brilliant and new. God is God is like a mother, strong and safe. You can crawl up into her lap whenever you want to. She will hold you until you, you fall asleep. God is like a father, gentle, gentle and safe. He will put you on top of his shoulders to give you a bird's eye view of all creation. creation. God is like three dancers, graceful and precise. precise. They move to the same music in, a, in very different ways. Showcasing, huh? showcasing, showcasing all of God's elegance and rhythm in your life. God is like a rainbow, vivid, 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 and full oh. of color and dancing. Dazzling remembering reminder reminder of every promise promise and hope you for for all people after a storm. God God is like a best friend. Faithful. Faithful and true. Closer to you than even you, your brother or sister. And because we know what God is like, we know that God is kind. God is forgiving. Forgiving. God is slow to get angry. God is quick to get angry. Glad. God is happy when you tell the truth and sad when things are um, 
of a bear. She is your protector. protector. He, he is trustworthy. Trust, trustworthy. Trust, trustworthy. They are friends when you feel alone. God hopes. God perseveres. Perseveres. God, what is God like? That's a very big question. One that people from places all around the world thought about all throughout, throughout all times have answered in many different ways. Keep searching. 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 Keep wondering. Keep learning about God. But when but where but whenever you are aren't, aren't sure what what feel feel no. God is like thinking think think about what make, makes you feel safe. What makes God you feel brave and what makes you feel loved? That's what God is like. Good job. Thank you. So whatever makes you feel safe, whatever makes you feel brave, whatever makes you feel loved, that's the God of your encounter. And so we turn to prayer, inviting God to provide that self-same safety and bravery and love for the world. Living God, we lift to you today our world, a world that is still messy and broken. We pray for more of the spirit of healing and wholeness, rebuilding and remaking your creation. Help us to notice your kingdom in our midst and expect to encounter you in surprising places. We pray for places in your world that we have been attuned to this week. Be it from the news headlines around the Eurovision Song Contest, or war zones, or the cost of living crisis. We're running out of words to pray, and so we ask that your kingdom come and your will be done. And loving God, we pray for those who are in leadership. Give them wisdom, integrity, and truth-telling. We pray especially for those in Westminster awaiting the Sue Gray report. And we pray for ourselves for our friends who are still represented by the empty seats, for our families and for our friends. Where there is hurt, we pray for your healing. Where there is pain, we pray for your comfort. Where there is grief, we pray for your hope. And we do pray for your Methodist Church as we continue to work out how to provide the best place for encounter. We begin to pray for the summer fair coming up as we take a tent and serve the community. We pray for Lego Church and the way in which we're continuing to build relationships with families. We pray for our relationship with St. Nicholas's School 
as we're beginning a coffee and drop-in session with staff, with pupils and with parents. We continue to pray for opportunities for us to be changed and to notice the spirit at work. And so courageously loving God, as we have held the universe in our hands in a simple piece of charcoal, we courageously pray that you would encounter us today. Transform us by your spirit. Enable us to see you differently and to press into the question of what God is like for ourselves. And so, living God, take the silences and poverty of our words, the hopes and dreams of our hearts, and our desire to see your kingdom come as we pray the words that Jesus taught his friends. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Just before we sing our final hymn together, um, one further mini plug. Um, if being outdoors is more your thing, or you'll just get to about 6.30 this evening and realise that you're really bored and you can't quite face the quiz shows that are on the telly just yet. Um, it would be really lovely if you fancied coming to a rogation service um, to be held on Leefields Farm off Horsebrook Lane in Brood. Um, I will make sure that Helen has the address and we'll circulate it around um, on email this afternoon. Um, but the tradition of rogation, today being Rogation Sunday, is an opportunity to pray for the boundaries of a community and also to pray God's blessing upon the things within that community. Um, and so there's an invitation from Brood Methodist Church and from the churches together in Brood and Bishop's Wood to stand in a field and to pray blessing on the crops and the bees and the waterways and the canal system um, as we stand and look over it uh, from the field at Leafields Farm. Um, it's unusual, it's strange, and yet it's deeply ancient as well. Um, if you're not able to join us and you would like just to see the prayers that have been written, um, they're currently on the photocopier, so grab a cup of tea and then ask me for a copy <laughs> um, and you can take away the prayers um, if being, getting to the farm is not going to be what you're able to do. But otherwise, 6.30 at Leafields Farm for a celebration of rogation on this Rogation Sunday. We conclude by singing the blessing together. Thank you. Please stand uh, as we sing the blessing. Now, don't, um, don't think that you're going to get away with this lightly. This has got energy to it. Uh, a blessing I always thought in the previous years as being something which is gentle and calm and, 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 and pleasing and very sort of... Mm, this goes at a, has, has energy and it goes a little bit, um, a bit wild at some times. Or I, I, I certainly hope that we provide it wild anyway. Um, Please stand and we'll sing. Oh, excuse me, we'll sing the blessing.
favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and their children and their children and their children this favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and their children and their children and their children in its presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning and the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you he is for you So may the blessing of God, the one who makes you feel safe and brave and loved, be with you and surprise you in encounters through this week as you see God's kingdom come. Amen.